everybody, this is Kristen Klein with Sawheim Enterprises and I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope you're staying safe out there and taking care of each other. Uh, I'm here today to bring you another webinar on uh, management of the COVID patient. And this webinar today is going to be about proning patients with COVID. Now, I know what you guys are probably thinking, why do I care about proning? That is only something they do in the ICU and I am not an ICU nurse. Well, I'm here to tell you that proning is actually turning out to be one of the most interventions that you can do for your patients to help improve their outcomes. And what is so exciting about that is guess what? You don't have to ask permission to do it, right? You don't need a doctor's order. You don't have to ask anybody. This is a nurse-driven, nurse-led intervention, which we love those, right? The things that we can do without having to ask permission for that are actually gonna make a big evidence-based difference in our patient's outcome, we live for these type of things, right? At least I do, and I'm a big nerd, so that's why I'm here in front of the camera I get bringing you this webinar today. So proning your patient, what does this mean? Proning your patient means just what it sounds like, flipping them on their stomach. Now, going back, um, thinking about pathophysiology just a little bit as to why we might wanna do this for our COVID patients and why it works so well. Our bodies are designed as humans. We originally walked on all fours. We were quadrupeds. And so our lungs were suspended face down. This is the way that they were designed and developed to be well perfused that way. And so if we are in times of distress or when our lungs are not being optimally perfused, then the prone position is the way to give the body the least amount of effort to work against uh, for that gas exchange to happen. So what happens in the COVID patient is we get these um, ARDS-like symptoms. Now, we don't know for sure if it is ARDS or if it's just a similar type of disease process, but when we are talking about um, the the ARDS and what this looks like in their lungs is ground glass opacities. Now this is the diagnostic um, evidence that we see on CT scan of these patients. Now what we are describing when we say a ground glass opacity, this is an area of the lung that uh, atelectasis has occurred. So those terminal alveoli are collapsed and fluid has collected. And so this is a part of the lung where gas exchange is not able to occur. Oxygen is not able to make it out of the lungs and into the bloodstream. So as this atelectasis continues and grows, and as these areas of the lung become larger and larger, this is where we get respiratory failure, uh, which leads to the um, sequelae that ultimately um, is terminal sequelae with the COVID patient. And so it's really important for us to identify these patients and to intervene as soon as we possibly can. So identifying these patients. Now, I hope by now that my frontline ICU nurses that all of you have access to N95s um, or PAPRs. We, part of the definition of a pandemic means that everybody has it. That is what uh, makes it a pandemic. So you guys as the frontline gatekeepers in the emergency department, you have to be fully protected because there is really no way to know um, who has COVID and who does not. Now, if you are not having access to full PPE, um, I invite you to check out the Get Us PPE campaign online. Um, you can also check out our friend Sarah with New Thing Nurse, and uh, she is fundraising to get uh, PPE directly to frontline nurses, so I want you to check out her website, newthingnurse.com, and the hashtag Get Us PPE will source you to um, different campaigns uh, nationwide to help uh, provide PPE to um, to frontline staff. So I hope you guys are all using the highest amount of protection available to you and advocating for that because it's definitely needed. Something like 25% of these patients have no symptoms at all when they walk in through the front door and 50% of patients do not have a fever. So these are, you know, two criteria that we look for to try to weed these patients out and we know that those symptoms aren't always there. A lot of times now we're finding these um, ground glass opacities as an incidental finding when we're working a patient up for other things. So there really is no classical presentation of COVID. The one kind of diagnostic indicator that would uh, lead us to suspect COVID without doing anything else would be low oxygen saturation or hypoxemia. This is really the hallmark of the COVID patient. They are not getting good um, blood flow to their bloodstream because of that process that I just told you about that's happening in their lungs. Now, especially in older adults, this might be what's known as a silent hypoxemia, meaning they are not in respiratory distress, meaning you just 
just put that oxygen sat monitor on their finger and it reads low, but they don't look like they're struggling to breathe. Now, another thing I'm gonna tell you to put away in your assessment of these patients is your stethoscope. Now, if you're an ER nurse like me, you probably haven't been able to find your stethoscope for a few years in the department, but now I'm gonna let you off the hook on that one because we are suggesting now that you do not use your stethoscope. One, because it is a huge fomite for infection, right? We can't sterilize it very well in between patients, and it does not give us any real good information about these patients. It doesn't give us any information that changes their course of treatment. So I'm gonna let you guys off the hook. You don't have to feel guilty about the fact that you don't know where your stethoscope is because you do not wanna be using it for these patients. Your oxygen sat monitor is going to be your best friend. So if your patient walks in the room, you get them on the monitor and their oxygen saturation is low. If they're able to, this is when you're gonna ask your patient to flip on their stomach. Just roll right over on their stomach. You can apply oxygen to them, uh, supplemental oxygen via a variety of different ways. Now, I'm recording this video for you um, to be aired on April 13th, uh, Lucky 13. Uh, so the information that is on this video is uh, current and accurate as of the 13th. So early on in this um, in this disease process and at, in the um, development of treatment, we were saying um, no non-invasive uh, ventilation, no CPAP or BiPAP because there was a high risk of um, aerosolizing droplets there. Now we are saying that actually CPAP is okay and also high flow nasal cannula. So this is not um, those green cannulas that deliver up to 10 liters. Um, this is the cannula that looks a little bit more like a nasal CPAP that delivers um, 40 to 60 liters. Um, and the reason that we believe this works is that positive pressure helps to hold those um, alveoli open um, to help perfuse those uh, collapsed areas of the lung. And uh, research has looked at, you know, do these procedures really aerosolize a lot? Now, the um, amount of force that a droplet would come out of a patient's mouth when they cough is the equivalent to about 400 liters per minute of oxygen. So if you're looking at 40 to 60 liters per minute of oxygen in a patient that is just um, able to breathe on their own, that is you know just a tenth of that. And so the danger is very low when you're using something like um, that special high flow cannula um, or just a regular green um, high flow nasal cannula it's a very low risk of aerosolizing when you're using those two interventions. And they're very, very helpful as far as avoiding intubation. We still are avoiding um, nebulizers, but um, inhalers will work very well. Um, try to use a spacer if you can. And uh, what I have been reading says about four to eight sprays um, of a inhaler will equal a nebulizer treatment. So um, that is another option available to you there. So flip them on their stomachs right away, apply oxygen as needed. Now, uh, you wanna keep a close eye on them. These patients obviously need to be uh, mentating well. They need to be able to um, protect and maintain their airway, and they need to be able to tolerate this position. Now, a couple of indicators that are gonna let you know if um, this patient is stable enough to tolerate it um, is and if they're gonna be able to you know, be discharged home with this um, intervention in place is if their oxygen requirements decrease um, after you have them on your stomach. You should know this within a couple of hours. Now, if you've been laying, laying them on their stomach and their oxygen needs are increasing or not really improving, or if they are deteriorating, as in they are becoming more dyspneic or they're having more difficulty breathing. Now this is a patient that you're not gonna be able to discharge. You're gonna to want to be um, thinking about intubating them. But as you've been proning them and increasing their oxygenation, what you're doing is you're taking that patient from you know, a patient that you're going to have to um, do a crash intubation on to um, a little bit more of an elective procedure. You've um, given them some increased oxygen, you've given them a little bit more time, and now you have time to decide you know, what do we wanna do and then prepare for an intubation that is more controlled and that is going to be safer for everybody. Now let's say you your patient is lower risk, they're doing well with that proning, they're tolerating it well, um, and you're thinking about discharging them home. Now remember, about 80% of patients who contract COVID are going to be stable and not require hospitalization. So this um, 
this represents a huge, you know, the majority of our patients that we're going to see are going to be um, able to be discharged home. Sometimes we're discharging these patients home with oxygen and um, pulse oximetry. Now, if this is the case, you're going to want to um, teach them about proning themselves at home. And uh, this is the information that was really requested um, by a lot of you after um, seeing our last video on RSI. So um, when we're talking about proning, we want them to be proned or laying on their stomach for at least 12 hours. Um, research is showing 18 hours per day is optimal as far as um, oxygenating their lungs well. So when we have them lay on their stomach, what is happening is fluid is not becoming dependent anymore in their lungs, right? So fluid settles to the bottom, air rises. So now we have this lung tissue that um, is not collapsed, that is um, able to be perfused better and gas exchange is able to happen. And then as those more dependent collapsed sections are then moved um, to the top, then that fluid can drain out of those um, out of those collapsed segments and they can open back up again. This also allows them to mobilize their secretions so that they can cough them up. So what this really does is just allows their lungs to heal um, while you're perfusing areas of the lungs that might not be perfused if they were laying flat on their back. So 12 to 18 hours a day is what we're asking patients to do if we're saying, you know, we want you to be proning yourself. So a couple ways you can do this. If your patient normally sleeps on their back, you can encourage them to sleep on their stomach. Um, and chances are they're, um, the convalescent phase of COVID um, is pretty lengthy and they're going to be sleeping a lot anyway. So this is a pretty easy way to accomplish that proning. Now, all of this is going to depend on their ability to tolerate that positioning. If they are older and have kyphosis or um, this is just not a tolerable position for them because of back issues or um, other concerns, um, one adaptation you can make is to have them change positions. So laying on their left side and then flip to their right side every two to three hours. This is not as effective as complete proning, but at least the lungs are changing positions so that you're giving um, other areas of their lung a chance to be perfused. Um, if they need to like lay on towels or different pillows, like they have different um, like body length pillows or some crazy like pregnancy pillows. There's, you know, different types of pillows that we can use to kind of help support their body so that they can tolerate um, laying on their stomach if at all possible. Um, during the day, if they're not sleeping, they can try doing it on like an upside down chair or like a yoga or exercise ball, one of those big giant ones and kind of lean over it. That might take some stress and pressure off of um, other areas of their body. Um, you can be creative with how they accomplish this. Now, if you want to um, give them some information, you can look up um, postural drainage therapy. Now, um, postural drainage was used um, a long time ago for patients with cystic fibrosis to help them kind of mobilize the secretions at home so that they wouldn't build up and get pneumonia. Uh, it's, a t it's a treatment that's gone out of fashion a little bit, but just like um, lots of things in medicine, everything that's old is new again. And so, um, the information that is out there for patients about um, postural drainage can be very helpful for you to give them on discharge just because it shows them different ways to um, help achieve those different body positions with what they might have at home. Now keep in mind with postural drainage, it shows them all different types of positions. Now they don't have to do the whole sequence um, of body positioning. Um, proning on their stomach is the best thing that they can do, and, um, but if they can't do that, um, flipping from side to side is gonna be the next, uh, next best thing. Now you really um, need to choose your patient population very carefully of the patients um, that you are going to um, discharge with this. Now they're going to um, need to have a pulse oximeter um, at home or one available to them um, so that they can monitor their oxygen saturation. Uh, you need to have the ability that either they are calling to check in with the Department of Health or with your hospital or um, whatever procedure that you have in place for them um, or that they have somebody that can check in on them daily and see how they're doing. 
they need to be able to self-isolate for the um, recommended amount of time. Now, this not only means to stay at home, but this means that they have their own um, sleeping area and their own bathroom so that they are um, isolated from the rest of their family as well. Um, and they need to know uh, what signs and symptoms to return um, if things are getting worse. So um, increased fever, altered mental status, or if their um, oxygen saturations are um, getting lower despite um, increasing their oxygen um, and increasing that proning time. Remember, these patients deteriorate very, very quickly, and our first sign is going to be that decrease in oxygen saturation. So uh, making sure that they're monitoring those uh, very, very closely. This is another great option for your uh, nursing home DNR patients um, to help uh, to help ease their clinical course and um, keep them out of the hospital and hopefully keep them from um, decompensating uh, to the point of requiring intubation. So any patient that comes into you, uh, make sure you're flipping them on their stomach. Make sure you're proning them uh, to help with their oxygenation. And then with discharging them, it's just as easy as telling them to lay on their stomach. Lay on their stomach as much as they can um, to get off their back as much as possible. Um, a good reminder for this is what type of patients are face up, toe up? dead ones in coffins, right? So if we want to keep our COVID patients alive we want, and out of the ICU and out of a coffin, <laughs> we want them to be laying flat on their stomachs, right? So proning is not just for ICU nurses anymore. In fact, you ER nurses are going to be so good at it that in the ICU, they won't even have to do it because you'll have already taken care of it and discharged them home. And all that training the ICU nurses are getting on proning again is going to go right out the window. They're not even going to need it because you guys in the ER are going to have it taken care of. So I want to thank you guys for all your comments, for sharing all your stories. It's been so great to see um, how you guys are getting through this and different techniques that you're using and trying in your emergency department. So if you guys have been using this in your ER, I would love for you to share your success stories and show us, um, tell us how it worked for you and other tips and um, tricks that you have tried. Um, I do want to give a big shout out to Justine from Georgia. Her uh, manager uh, reached out to me after uh, our RSI webinar and Justine was able to save a patient's life using uh, what she saw in our webinar, which is awesome. And she has earned epic legend status in her emergency department after she grabbed the uh, wrapping from the Foley catheter insertion kit and used that as a shield while they were suctioning their patient before they intubated them. Justine is a baby nurse, and not only was she able to immediately use what she learned on our webinars, now she is going um, and working with her department educator to teach uh, the other ER nurses what she learned. So uh, great job, Justine. I'm so proud of you. And if you have stories like that, we would love to hear them. It's so awesome to hear about um, ER nurses educating other nurses and um, supporting each other. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope this has been helpful for, uh, to you. And um, let us know at Solheim Enterprises, what other education that you are needing. We are happy to bring it to you. Um, we are in this with you. We support you. We love you. And we got this. Thanks, guys.